Hello, everyone. So <clears throat> we start today with uh, the first lecture by Professor David Vanderbilt. Um, can you hear us at, uh, if people connected at, um, through Zoom? Maybe just write something in the chat. Yes, OK, fantastic. I think we can start. So, OK, let me see. Okay, screen. Um, I'm not, probably not going to be watching the chat. OK. So uh, if you can. Yeah, again, so maybe, maybe for those who are connected, you can, you can wait maybe until the end of the lecture to ask questions. You can either write them in the chat, or you can raise your hand virtually on Zoom. And then we will, we will uh, unmute you, and, and you will be allowed to, to ask your questions at the end. Yeah, I don't mean I don't mind at all being interrupted. So you know, if you ask questions in the chat or something, somebody somebody will alert me and then uh, read me the question or something. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm a, a longtime visitor of ICTP. I don't. It's not quite an uncountable number of times that I've been here, but it's wonderful to be back for the first time after COVID. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Um, so what I've uh, decided to do to be a little bit orthogonal to what was done yesterday is to focus in on a couple of topics uh, about uh, use of 1A functions. One is for a derivation of the uh, theory of orbital magnetization. And the second is about uh, something called hybrid 1A functions um, and uh, in the context of that, I'll talk a little bit about uh, topology and topological obstruction. Uh, so here's the overall outline uh, of the talk. Um, and the first part, as I said, will be about theory of orbital magnetization um, with a little bit about results, just to, to add a little bit of something other than uh, methods and theory in here. And then, um, and then about hybrid 1A functions towards the end. And I'll see how I do with time. Um, uh, the, the top row here, of course, are the people who wrote the reviews of modern physics uh, with me. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, 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 activity. We were, uh, those were in the early days of Skype. We had Skype meetings with all five of us from, from multiple continents. And uh, we, we, you know, we uh, published the paper in alphabetical order of the authors. But luckily, Nicola was the first in the alphabet because he was the obvious uh, first among equals in this. And, uh, uh, I enjoyed his uh, historical presentation very much yesterday. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, he makes it all, all sound so seamless and, and direct in retrospect. Uh, at the time, I remember going down a lot of blind alleys and trying the different things that didn't work and so on. So don't get the impression that everything happens right the first time. And the same was true of orbital magnetization, as I'll come to in a moment. Uh, the initial papers with, were with Timo Tonhauser and Davide Tirasoli and with Raffaella. Uh, and then there's a later paper with uh, Ivo and myself. Um, I'll, I'll give you the references later. And then the people at the bottom here are others, uh, mostly students of mine or collaborators uh, who have been involved in the work at various times. And I'm not going to be careful about giving uh, proper acknowledgement as I go along. In a few cases, I will, but, uh, but not always. OK, so uh, let me start just by uh, setting up the problem of orbital magnetization. And what is the problem of orbital magnetization? Well, it's similar to the problem of electric polarization. In electric polarization, real crystals have some distributed uh, charge density. Um, you, there's no way of dividing uh, the unit cells into discrete uh, uh, units with vacuum in between, uh, unlike what's shown in the textbook at, at right. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, what we uh, conclusion we come to is that even if you knew exactly what the crystal in charge density was, uh, since it's only related to the polarization by a divergence of the polarization, and if I add any constant vector to the polarization uh, uniform uh, through space, I'll get the same charge density. So that tells me that the charge density does not determine the average value of polarization. And so uh, what we learned, uh, we as a community learned uh, back in the 90s was that charge density by itself is insufficient even in principle to determine polarization. And the same thing is true of orbital magnetization. So <clears throat> if you imagine that you know uh, the orbital uh, current J of R uh, everywhere locally inside a unit cell, that's not enough to determine the magnetization because the, uh, uh, the uh, 
the current is only the curl, which is a derivative of the magnetization. So if I add a constant magnetization, uh, I don't change the, the current. And again, if uh, the world is made up of little circulating currents with vacuum in between, then we can make a definition based on unit cells. But in general, we can't, and so there's a problem with orbital magnetization. Now, the problem with orbital magnetization is actually uh, a much milder problem because in actuality, uh, real orbital currents do look a lot like the picture uh, on the right-hand side. There's, uh, currents are mostly in the uh, D shell or F shell of a magnetic ion, and there's not much current in between. And so for many years, uh, people uh, ha have had and continue to calculate uh, orbital moments by integrating the currents inside some spheres and assuming that the current is zero outside those spheres, and that's actually a pretty good physical approximation, uh, as we'll see later. Uh, but it doesn't answer the question of, in principle, what is really the correct way of computing the magnetic field, uh, sorry, the magnetization, and uh, that's the problem that we uh, set ourselves uh, a long time ago uh, when we did this work. So uh, let me start by, again, by analogy with uh, uh, a toy derivation of electric polarization. Uh, this is not the derivation that I really uh, prefer because it doesn't uh, discuss orbitals, it doesn't discuss uh, adiabatic currents, which I think is the proper way of doing it. But uh, here's, the, here's, the, here's the idea. Suppose I have some, uh, let's imagine a two-dimensional system. Uh, I make a sample, which is maybe 100 by 100 uh, square unit cells, so it's a finite sample. These uh, size are um, the extended eigenstates of the entire sample, a little bit like block states, but, but with boundary conditions. And from those, uh, from the set of all whatever uh, 10,000 uh, uh, extended states, I form uh, maximally localized uh, orbitals, uh, which is the, the finite system uh, analog of Wannier functions, and those are what I call WM. And then uh, each one of those is uh, exponentially localized, and I sum the uh, expectation values of the position operators of all of them, and that's the dipole moment of the entire sample and then I divide that by the sample area to get the polarization. And so that's, uh, <clears throat> if I do that in the thermodynamic limit, I'm dominated by the uh, localized orbitals that are in the interior of the sample, and those look just like bulk Wannier functions, so all I have to do is take one Wannier function, I'm assuming here just a single, uh, <clears throat> a single uh, band uh, insulator, I take the one Wannier function localized in the home unit cell, that's what this zero in the ket is a, a notation for the Wannier function in the home unit cell. I take the expectation value of x, and that gives me the polarization. Uh, so that uh, turns out to be the correct answer, of course. Uh, there's a little bit more algebra to put it into the form of a Berry phase. Uh, as you uh, heard yesterday, you take the cell periodic part of the block function, you put it into this definition of uh, the Berry connection, and if you integrate the Berry connection uh, over the Brewen zone, you get the polarization. Uh, you can also take an additional <coughs> wave vector derivative of the Berry connection to get a Berry curvature, and the Berry curvature is responsible for the um, anomalous Hall uh, conductivity. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, and, and, and here's the derivation, again, that, that shows that if I uh, take the uh, X expectation value of the position operator, it gets related to uh, the Berry phase, because when you multiply by X and you do an integration by parts, you get a D by DK, which appears down here, and so uh, you get this Berry phase expression for the polarization. So I'm sorry, I'm, I did that a little quickly because I just wanted to set up uh, an analogous um, <coughs> uh, pathway for trying to derive orbital magnetization, uh, which is what we set out to do with, uh, with these collaborators. Um, on the rest of this slide, so the, the highlighted green thing is what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next 20 minutes. Um, uh, just before our work, there was a semi-classical derivation by the group of Chen Yu um, uh, at the University of Texas uh, from a very different point of view, from the point of view of wave packets and the classical um, uh, evolution of, uh, of quantum wave packets. Um, and uh, the results of the two theories uh, turn out to be the same, uh, although the uh, semi-classical derivation is a little bit more general because it also works for metals. Um, and then we had a second paper where we uh, dealt with the multiband case. Uh, there was another uh, derivation, um, again, from the Chen Yu group based on a long wave derivation a little bit later. 
And then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, multiband uh, and magnetic circular dichroism paper with uh, Ivo Souza. So these are the, the relevant references for, for those who want to delve into the, into the theory. So um, for, for the next 20 minutes, my derivation is going to be based on uh, a two-dimensional uh, ferromagnetic insulator with the magnetization uh, normal to the plane. Uh, it's a single particle Hamiltonian. Uh, there's no uh, macroscopic B field. Uh, uh, just a single occupied band and spinless electrons. And so it would be something like the Haldane model uh, is, a, is a model of spinless electrons, but it has complex interneighbor hoppings uh, in order to break time reversal symmetry um, uh, in order to get a non-zero orbital magnetization. Or you could imagine some continuous uh, system in two dimensions that would have a single occupied band. Okay, so I'm going to try to follow the same logic that I followed for uh, the uh, electric polarization. I write down the orbital moment of the um, entire sample. Let's say I take a 100 by 100 uh, finite sample. I calculate all of the extended orbitals. I compute the uh, circulation. X times Vy minus Y times Vx is basically the angular momentum. And then I multiply by Q and uh, divide by C to turn that into 2C to turn that into an orbital moment. And I use the fact that the velocity is the commutator of the position with the Hamiltonian. And you do a little bit of algebra, and you get this, uh, this formula at the bottom for the orbital moment of the sample as a whole. That's an exact formula. And then you divide by the area of the sample, and um, uh, that should give you uh, uh, the, uh, something that has the units of orbital magnetization. And um, if you again assume that um, this quantity is going to be dominated by the 1A functions in the center of the sample, since the ones at the edge are just a, a set of measure zero relative to the, to the bulk, uh, then you would say that the macroscopic magnetization ought to be just given by uh, uh, evaluating this uh, matrix element of X times the Hamiltonian times Y for the 1A function in the home unit cell divide by the unit cell area. And um, since this involves a kind of a circulation, we call this the uh, local circulation uh, orbital magnetization. Uh, uh, and so our hypothesis uh, initially was uh, that uh, that should be the correct definition of orbital magnetization. And, um, and if you turn that into a k-space formula using the same kind of tricks that were used for the electric polarization, you get, um, you get a formula uh, that looks like this. So again, this is written in two dimensions. It's an integral over the two-dimensional Brewen zone. And then uh, what you have here is something that, let me go back just to show you. This looks very much like the Berry curvature. So where did I have a Berry curvature? Well, I didn't write it out, did I? Okay, but, but basically if the Hamiltonian were not in that matrix element, if HK was not here, this would be the Berry curvature but instead it's got the Hamiltonian uh, mixed in, uh, in, in, the, in the derivatives of the wave, fun wave functions with respect to wave vector. Uh, okay, so uh, we tested this on the Haldane model. Um, the Haldane model um, uh, is famously a model that has a topological phase, but we uh, were studying it in the non-topological, the trivial uh, part of the phase diagram. It has some complex hoppings that make the orbital magnetization be non-zero. And within tight binding, you can calculate the current flowing on every, uh, every bond. And what you're seeing there is a lot of little arrows that show the currents that are flow flowing on various bonds. And, um, and so you can map out the current everywhere, and you can calculate the uh, total uh, magnetic moment of the entire sample and divide by the sample area. And um, uh, uh, I guess that's what the red curve is. And then you can also calculate um, the, uh, what we thought was going to be the magnetization, the local circulation, uh, from the formula that I gave you based on the Wannier function. And we did that, and uh, you know, the results uh, just didn't agree at all. And uh, Rafaela, I'm sure you remember, uh, we kept kind of bugging these two postdocs to go back and check. <laughs> and you, you can't be right. You must be making a mistake somewhere. But they kept coming back and saying, no, no, we don't think there's anything wrong. And eventually we realized, so this is this uh, confusion. Uh, so eventually we realized that um, uh, there really was something wrong and it wasn't wrong in the calculation, it was wrong in our, uh, in our theory. And uh, so this is a, a lesson really that sometimes uh, trying to implement something on the computer, 
even in, in a simple tight binding model, um, teaches you uh, something. You can check whether your theory is sensible, and in this case, it told us that our theory was, uh, was missing something. And, and here's what it was missing. So what we really need to do is sum over all these localized orbitals of the, the circulation, R cross V, and I can rewrite that <clears throat> as R minus R bar, so I really should have labeled this as R bar subscript S. So that's the center of this particular Wannier function, uh, plus uh, R bar cross uh, the velocity matrix element. So all I've done is add and subtract this R bar term. But the local circulation piece that we calculated is really this, this first one, uh, labeled in green, and uh, we uh, did not include the second one uh, labeled in blue. And, and why not? Well, so the idea is this. If this 1A function has a non-zero velocity expectation value, then R bar cross the velocity is some orbital moment. Uh, however, in the bulk of the material, uh, the velocity matrix element of the Wannier function has to be zero. Because a bulk Wannier function, if the, <clears throat> if the velocity matrix element was non-zero, it would mean that in the ground state of the crystal, there's a non-zero current flowing. And that's not allowed to happen. And so it must be that for the bulk Wannier function, the expectation value of the velocity operator is zero, and so there is nothing coming from bulk Wannier functions. Uh, but uh, what about um, those uh, Wannier functions, by which I really mean the localized orbitals um, at the surface? Uh, is it possible that they have a contribution? And what we found is that when we looked instead of the currents on the various links, instead we evaluated the matrix element of the velocity operator in each Wannier function, we saw a picture that looks like this. Uh, so there's a Wannier function uh, localized basically on each one of these blue dots, uh, there actually is a very small arrow on the next blue dot in from the, from the border, uh, but it was too small to draw. But basically what you see is that there's a, a current. It looks like a current that's flowing around the perimeter, and it does not vanish in the, uh, in the um, extended limit, uh, uh, obviously, because if I make the sample twice as large, I still have the same current flowing around the boundary, and that corresponds to a, the same uh, uh, contribution of orbital magnetization. And so we called this the itinerant circulation. Uh, in our model calculation, we saw explicitly that it did exist, and uh, we calculated it uh, 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 and then added that to the uh, local circulation and finally got agreement with the direct calculation of the orbital moment of the entire sample. So uh, this was a, <laughs> it was a fun project, actually, because it was interesting to, to, to be brought up short and realize that uh, we had not understood something and we're forced to understand it uh, uh, better. Um, okay, so uh, there's a, a few steps I, uh, of, of derivation here which I've left out, um, which um, <clears throat> it, it looks like uh, in this picture, uh, this itinerant circulation depends upon the properties of the Wannier functions at the boundary, um, but there's an argument, and I, if I have time at the end, I'll go through the argument. I have a few slides at the end. Uh, I can pull it back up. Uh, which shows you that uh, uh, in the end you can rewrite that itinerant circulation contribution um, as, a, uh, as something that only involves bulk Wannier functions. Again, you start by plugging in the velocity uh, in here as a commutator of the coordinate operator and the Hamiltonian operator, but there's some additional uh, discussion about uh, how to get the boundary contribution to look like a bulk contribution. But at the end of the day, the itinerant circulation is written this way, this is the um, uh, sum over lattice vectors. Since I only have a single band, uh, the 1A function label is the same as the unit cell label. So uh, Rx is really uh, labeling uh, a 1A function, and that's the x coordinate of the lattice vector where it's located. Then I calculate the y expectation value of the matrix element of between 1A functions in the home cell and cell R. And then I uh, go back again and, and calculate the Hamiltonian matrix from H, uh, from R back to zero, and then the other term. Um, and if you convert this into K space, again, the algebra is going a little bit fast here, but it's a similar trick where when you have an X operator or a Y operator, you do an integration by parts, so it turns into a D by DX or a D by DY, which really uh, are the very connections. And a Hamiltonian operator, uh, of course, um, uh, can be uh, written in terms of a Fourier transform of the a band energy. 
and when you put all of this together, uh, so you've basically got a, a, the, the uh, anti-symmetric thing turns into a curl of the Berry connection, which is the Berry curvature, and you get this very simple formula down here. So the itinerant circulation is uh, just the Berry curvature uh, at a particular point in K space times the band energy at the same point in K space integrated over two dimensions. So if I didn't have this energy E of K here, this would be uh, basically the anomalous Hall conductivity, but with the energy in here, it's the uh, itinerant circulation contribution to the uh, orbital magnetization. Okay, so here's what the final uh, theory looks like, uh, all written in, in K space. So the derivation was done uh, in, uh, in terms of 1A functions, but uh, now it's been converted back into K space um, where um, in some ways it's easier to evaluate actually uh, as we'll I'll come to in a moment, probably the best way to evaluate it is using 1EA interpolation. But in any case, one can go back and forth between the, the 1EA basis and the K-space basis uh, in a straightforward way. Um, so this derivation works only for uh, insulators um, because I need to have 1EA functions defined, um, and for that I need filled bands throughout the Brewan zone. Um, <clears throat> and as I presented it, it was only for uh, single band uh, insulators. And so um, a more general derivation has to include doing everything in three dimensions, doing it for the multi-band multi case, including spin orbit turns out not to be particularly uh, uh, um, uh, subtle. It's, it's, it's rather straightforward, including non-collinear spins and so on. Um, the, uh, the, um, but uh, still for insulators, if you want to go beyond insulators, then the derivation of the Chen Yu group um, uh, using um, a semi-classical argument based on wave packets uh, gives you um, the proper uh, expression for, for a metal. And in that case, there's a Fermi energy that comes into this expression. Well, it's hard to see exactly what the relation is between these two expressions. But it turns out that they're identical for insulators. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bottom formula is the proper, um, uh, is the, is the proper extension for, for metals. Uh, so th that's something that's unlike the electric polarization problem is only defined for insulators and not, is not even a, a, a problem for metals. Uh, in the case of orbital magnetization, of course, exists for both. Uh, so here I want to give a, a call out to the paper with Evo uh, that came a little bit later about um, the relation to uh, magnetic circular dichroism. And really in this paper, we also did a more careful job of uh, treating the multiband uh, formulation. Um, and so uh, in this paper, uh, we divide things up in a slightly different way compared to the earlier uh, tonhauser sarasoli uh, papers. Um, uh, the, what I've been calling the local circulation piece is div divided into um, uh, uh, this, um, uh, S SR is short range, Evo? No, that's not right. Self-rotation. Self-rotation, thank you, thank you. Self-rotation piece, so that's basically like the local circulation. And then this one is like the itinerant circulation. But uh, the self-rotation is defined in a slightly different way. It's basically relative to 1EA centers rel instead of relative to lattice vector uh, centers. Um, and then uh, what we showed in this paper was that this self-rotation term number one uh, is gauge invariant. And this combination of these other two terms are gauge invariant. So gauge invariant in the sense that um, uh, Nicola introduced yesterday invariant with respect to a different choice of this unitary mixing matrix U of K throughout the Brewen zone. And, uh, and then, um, so, uh, so this is a way of decomposing things in such a way that you have two gauge invariant terms, which also has some computational uh, advantages. <clears throat> but it also suggests, as Nicola said, that there should be some experimentally measurable aspect of a gauge invariant quantity and uh, what uh, Evo found um, uh, was that you could relate this uh, first gauge invariant piece to a certain dichroic sum rule. I haven't written it out, but it's basically an integral uh, over frequency of the optical uh, absorption um, anti-symmetric part um, uh, integrated over all frequencies with maybe a power of omega in there. I don't quite remember. Um, but in any case, it's something like an F-sum rule, but for the anti-symmetric part of the um, conductivity, which is the dichroic uh, part of it. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> I said I would give a few um, experiment, uh, sorry, a few calculational results. Um, so uh, this is actually not our work, but um, uh, Davide Sarasoli, together with other uh, collaborators, uh, did a calculation of the uh, orbital magnetization of some real materials, iron, cobalt, and nickel, uh, using this theory. And uh, this delta M over here is something that I won't talk about. Uh, it, it comes from a core correction from the way that we're treating pseudopotentials. And so uh, let's ignore that. That's very small. What you see is that the local circulation piece is maybe five or 10 times larger than the itinerant circulation piece. So the local circulation piece, unlike in our uh, you know, Haldane model, it was like 50-50. Um, actually, they were opposite signs in that case. But, but here, in, in real life, the local circulation piece does tend to dominate when you add them together. You know, the local circulation would have given you a decent approximation as it happens. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> in this paper, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, we uh, did uh, similar calculations, but using uh, Wanier interpolation that Eva will talk about in the next lecture uh, to do the calculation. And um, well, there's a bunch of results here. This is for iron, cobalt, and nickel. The ones that have been grayed out are for magnetization tilted in some direction that is not the ground state orientation. So let's just focus on the correct ground state orientation. Over here are the experimental numbers for the orbital, uh, I'm sorry, uh, experimental numbers uh, for the orbital magnetization. And um, uh, 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 this muffin tin thing over here on the right hand side is where you only calculate orbital currents inside some spheres around the atoms and ignore the interstitial part. So that's a, an easier calculation to do. And this is using the quote unquote modern theory. I think Raffaella, we're, we're in an intermediate era where you're allowed to say modern theory if you put it in quotes. And then eventually we'll come to a point where we can't say it at all. But um, anyway, so this should be modern theory in quotes. Um, and, and what you see, uh, it, well, the, and reference 14 is the, is the Sarasoli at all. And so the two theories are in pretty good agreement with each other. There were different, different pseudopotentials, different codes. Um, but what you can see is that the Muffington calculation is, you know, qualitatively correct, the right sign, the right order of magnitude, but actually the modern theory numbers are in better agreement with experiment. They're not in perfect agreement either, but they're in better agreement on the whole with experiment than, than the Muffington numbers. Uh, I don't, uh, um, and there, there may be more up-to-date num numbers for this nowadays. I haven't really tracked the field to, to know. Okay, so maybe what I should do is, is stop for a moment and, and see if there are questions about this because I'm, I'm really kind of going to change gears a little bit to talk about hybrid 1A functions. So let's see if I have questions at this point. There's a question over there. Uh, is the the uh, contribution of each K point and each band to the orbital magnetization also a uh, physical quantity? For example, is it related to the orbital magnetic moment of each eigenstates? Um, yes. So the um, the work of the of the Chen Yu group um, addresses uh, that question. Um, so if you um, if you make a if you choose a particular uh, wave vector in the Brillouin zone. And then you construct a wave packet that is centered at that wave vector. So it, let's say a little Gaussian wave packet. So it's localized both in k-space and in real space. And so you can discuss its orbital moment. Its orbital moment is so I've divided this into local circulation and itinerant circulation. But that local moment is, corresponds to a particular linear combination of those two uh, contributions. Um, and then there's another contribution, which is um, called the density of states effect, which is that if you apply a uniform magnetic field, then the, the, the density of states is modified by a, an amount that's proportional to the Berry curvature. So basically, there's a second contribution which comes from the, that you can think of as the modification of the local density of states, which usually is just, you know, in, 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 um, in d-dimensional space, it's just 1 over 2 pi to the d. That's the density of states in k-space. But in the presence of an external magnetic field, that gets modified 
So there's a second term, which is the local modification of the local density of states. But yes, the, uh, the first term, which is the, the, the circulation of the wave packet, uh, does correspond to you know, one of the, some linear combination. And this other, other more spooky thing that I just mentioned is a different linear combination. And when you sum them, you get the same things. So there is, in some sense, a physical uh, 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 interpretation of the local object in K-space. Let me just see if there's something in the chat. No, it doesn't look like it. Anything else? OK, uh, we can have questions at the end as well. So let me, let me go on then. Uh, to talk about uh, hybrid 1A functions. And so uh, let me uh, begin just uh, for a moment by talking a little bit about uh, topology and what I regard as the simplest kind of topology, which is the two-dimensional uh, quantum anomalous fall insulator. Um, what happens in the case of a quantum anomalous fall insulator, it has to be um, a ferromagnet or it has to have broken time reversal symmetry in order for this to happen. Uh, it has the property that if you apply uh, a small electric field in the x direction, this curly E is an electric field, you get a transverse current um, uh, in the 90 degree uh, direction, this current J. And the uh, ratio of the transverse current to the longitudinal electric field is exactly E squared over H, or in general, it's an integer times E squared over H, where the integer is known as the churn number. And so this is like the integer uh, quantum hole effect, but uh, there's no external uh, magnetic field here. We just have to have a two-dimensional uh, system uh, that uh, <clears throat> has broken time reversal symmetry that plays the same role that an external magnetic field would play. Um, so how does this uh, kind of um, topological insulator come about? Uh, one way of understanding it <clears throat> is by this uh, kind of hybrid space um, uh, view, um, and what I'm going to do here is do something a little bit unusual. Uh, we're used to working in real space. Let's say this is a real space unit cell with uh, dimensions A and B measured in angstroms, and we're used to dealing in reciprocal space. This, let's say, is a Brie 1 zone where the um, lattice vectors uh, have units of inverse angstroms, and I'm going to start working in this hybrid space which is a space in which, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have wave vector in units of inverse angstroms, and on the vertical axis, we have uh, real space uh, in the y direction. So uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult to wrap your he head around the first time you see it, but I think once you'll get used to it, you'll see it's a, it's a, useful, it's a useful trick. And so one way to think about what we're doing is, let's say we have a two-dimensional insulator, single-band insulator, again, to make things simple. Um, and so uh, I've got a mesh of K points in this diagram at the left. And what I choose to do is I choose to um, look at uh, each uh, individual KX point and think of the string of K points along the Y direction as a kind of a one-dimensional uh, uh, system along the Y direction. And I can wanierize the system in one dimension. Uh, I do a one-dimensional wanierization along the Y direction to get uh, local uh, 1A functions and 1A centers in the Y direction. And what I'm plotting here are the 1A centers in the Y direction uh, plotted versus wave vector Kx as K goes across the Brie 1 zone. And of course, the left and right sides of the Brie 1 zone are really identified, so I have to come back to myself. And this uh, shaded uh, object up here is really the same set of uh, 1A centers because if I uh, translate, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that yet. If I translate uh, by <clears throat> uh, uh, one lattice vector, which is like uh, updating the Berry phase by 2 pi, uh, that doesn't really change anything. So there's another 1A function up here, and there's another one up there, and so on. And so because the left and right sides of the uh, unit cell are identified with each other, you might think this is the only thing that can happen, but you already saw me flash ahead to the next picture. Uh, that's not the only thing that can happen. What can happen is that uh, as you go across the Brie 1 zone, the location of the 1A center in the y direction in real space, as you go across the Brie 1 zone uh, in Kx space, 
may have this kind of winding. It may wind by uh, 2 pi, or it could even wind by 4 pi or minus 2 pi. And that winding number, 1, 2, or minus 1, is known as the churn number. What I've illustrated here has a churn number of 1. And you can kind of understand two things from this picture. One is that this winding number is a topological invariant. That is to say, if I take this Hamiltonian for my two-dimensional system and I, uh, I, I, I gently uh, modify the Hamiltonian, uh, I make some adiabatic change of the Hamiltonian, the winding number can't change unless something drastic happens. And what that would be is if the system goes through a metallic uh, phase and then back into an insulating phase, once it's in the metallic phase, this picture doesn't apply anymore. And when it comes out into a new insulating phase, it can change its winding number back to, back to something else. Sorry. It, so it can go from here to a metal to here. But without going through a metallic phase, it can't change the winding number. Um, the second thing you can understand from this is in some generic way, some uh, hand-waving way, why it is that this um, churn number uh, corresponds to uh, anomalous Hall conductivity. So you know from uh, Boltzmann transport theory that if you apply an electric field, let's say, in the x direction, this applies a force on the electrons, and the electron wave packets migrate in the uh, kx direction at a, at a speed which is proportional to the uh, electric field. I'm, I'm kind of imagining for the moment that electrons have positive charge. So they, let's say they go, electron wave packets also go to the right. As they do that, they climb up in real space y direction. So they're actually, Wannier centers are moving vertically in the y direction, which corresponds to a vertical current. And so you get a, uh, sorry, you get a, uh, a vertical current that is proportional to the horizontal electric field. And when you work out the details of that, it turns out that it's exactly, I, I didn't write the formula again, but it turns out that the uh, anomalous Hall conductivity, uh, sigma yx, is just e squared over h times this churn number. So in this case, it's exactly e squared over h. It basically, you just, if you work out for the electric field, uh, you know, one block period is how long it takes the wave packet to go across the Brewan zone. In that time, it also moves by exactly one lattice constant in the y direction. And you put in the numbers, and it turns into just e squared over h. OK, <clears throat> so what have we actually done? Well, here I'm just focusing on the uh, Wannier center positions of these one-dimensional chains of k, uh, of k points. Uh, but we can also focus on the uh, uh, eigenstates uh, for which those are the eigenvalues. In other words, uh, at a given kx, I uh, uh, I, I construct these 1a functions, but these 1a functions are still extended in the x direction. So that's the picture that I have at the top here. This is a hybrid 1a function. H is for hybrid 1a function. It has a quantum label kx because it's well defined at each kx. It also extends across uh, to infinity in the x direction, but it's uh, exponentially localized in the y direction. So here, this is a picture of the block function over here. Of course, there's another hybrid 1a function if I choose to Wannierize first in the x direction uh, and then keep ky as a, uh, as a wave vector index. And then here is the regular, uh, the, uh, the 1a function that's really uh, uh, localized in, in, in both dimensions. And uh, uh, basically, uh, to go from the block functions to the 1a functions, you just Fourier transform in both x and y directions. But if you just transform first only in the y direction and then in the x direction, you go by this top path. So Fourier transform in the y direction gives you these hybrid 1a functions. And you know if you look carefully in the upper corner here, I wrote the Fourier transform formulas that tells you uh, how these things are related to each other. But uh, I think you get the idea. Um, you basically just, instead of doing the Fourier transform simultaneously in both uh, x and y, you do it only in x or only in y. And so the center of charge of this hybrid 1a function in the y direction at a given kx is what I was plotting in this figure. Uh, uh, but we can also recover the entire hybrid 1a function itself if we want, and that's useful to do for, for some uh, purposes. So uh, one thing you should appreciate if you are um, especially uh, uh, exposed to the field of topological insulators is that these hybrid 1a centers are one and the same thing as what people call Wilson loop eigenvalues. Uh, the Wilson loop is uh, something that um, uh, is more of a favorite of people from a field theory 
uh, formal background, uh, and I won't explain exactly what the Wilson loop is, uh, but <clears throat> uh, essentially, um, uh, when you uh, do this uh, construction of one-dimensional Wannier functions and, and, and pull out the Wannier centers, that's mathematically identical to calculating the Wilson loop eigenvalues um, uh, expressed as, as numbers, as phase angles between zero and two pi. Um, and the other thing I, I should say is that this, this one-dimensional Wannierization is uh, very simple. Uh, I don't think Nicola uh, uh, dwelled on this yesterday, but it turns out that you don't have to do any projection, you don't have to do any iteration, you don't have to do any, max the maximally localized Wannier functions in one, dire in one dimension can be computed by essentially straightforward diagonalization techniques and very fast, no iteration required, and, um, uh, and free, of, uh, 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 free of topological obstruction. I haven't talked about topological obstruction yet, but I, I will in a moment. Um, uh, so uh, uh, unless this particular string of K points happens to hit a, uh, a vial point or something like that, uh, you can always uh, construct the hybrid 1A function. And our perspective here is going to be not only just to look at the hybrid Wannier centers, which is uh, usually the Wilson loop uh, perspective, but also uh, the Wannier functions, hybrid Wannier functions themselves uh, are often uh, useful. Okay, so uh, let me use these hybrid Wannier functions to talk about uh, topological uh, obstruction. This is maybe not the only or even the most natural way to talk about topological obstruction, but. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's one way. So here again is what I did before. I construct the, the hybrid 1A centers for each kx corresponding to the string of points along the ky direction, and I, I plot them like this. And uh, you might ask, um, uh, what mathematical formula describes this uh, curve, which is y bar as a function of kx? So all you have to do to, to answer that question is to take your hybrid 1A functions, uh, so this zero means it's the one at ry equals zero, um, and calculate the expectation value of the y operator as a function of kx, and if you plug in the Fourier transform formulas that relate the hybrid 1A function to the true 1A functions, uh, oops, <clears throat> I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to, 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 to do the cursor on the screen instead of with a laser pointer because I know that the people who are seeing this uh, virtually don't see the laser pointer, but occasionally my finger misses. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Okay, so it turns out that the expression is just this. You have to take a matrix element of a position operator, Y position operator, between two uh, ordinary Wannier functions, one at the origin and one displaced by, by x. So origin and x, you calculate the y matrix element between them. Because the Wannier functions are exponentially localized, this is only non-zero for a few Wannier functions that are nearby. And so you get a few Fourier components, and those Fourier components describe the, the variation of this, of this curve that I drew up here. But there's no way that I could ever possibly get a curve that looks like this from from this kind of Fourier transform, right? Because it's just, you know, uh, it's just a, a sum. These, these matrix elements over here are just some finite numbers. The sum only has a few terms in it, and obviously uh, it has to come back to itself. Um, and so what this means is that uh, if these Wannier functions exist, if the system can be described by localized Wannier functions, then the hybrid Wannier centers can never have a non-zero winding. And therefore, uh, the system uh, must be topologically trivial. Or conversely, if the system is not topologically trivial, if it's topological, if it has this churn number of one or minus two, then 1A functions do not exist. It's not possible to make maximally localized 1A functions of this uh, two-dimensional sample. And um, uh, in either case, by the way, the hybrid 1A functions do exist. So the topological obstruction doesn't obstruct you as far as killing the hybrid 1A functions, but it does kill the existence of ordinary uh, 1A functions. Um, another way of seeing this is from the point of view of, uh, uh, that Nicola mentioned yesterday, that normally you insist on a gauge which is not only smooth and continuous, but also periodic, and it turns out that that's just not possible to find such a gauge in the case of a topological insulator. <clears throat> 
It's a little bit like the story of describing spinners on the block sphere. There's no gauge that you can choose that doesn't have a singularity somewhere. The, the gauge that you see in most textbooks has a singularity at the South Pole. Okay, um, that's for a certain kind of uh, topological insulator, uh, namely the quantum spin, uh, the quantum hole insulator that occurs in a sample that has broken time reversal symmetry. Just briefly, I want to mention <clears throat> that when you do have time reversal symmetry, uh, you have a different kind of topological insulator in two dimensions, which is called a quantum spin hole insulator, or a Z2 topological insulator. Z2 is just uh, means either uh, even or odd, so it just it's either ordinary or it's topological. And uh, the way this, uh, you can think about this is that a quantum spin hole operator is, uh, insulator is basically like superposing a um, quantum anomalous hall state with a plus one churn number and a quantum anomalous hall state with minus one churn number, this one for the spin up electrons and the second one for the spin down electrons, and you put them in the same material. And um, that has time reversal symmetry because the time reversal symmetry reverses the sign of the churn number, but also it reverses the sign of the spin. So the system as a whole comes back to itself. And you can then turn on some spin orbit coupling or something, and it, it still has this topological property. And um, uh, in this case, there's no um, uh, ordinary anomalous hole conductivity because the upspin and downspin currents cancel each other, but there's a kind of a spin current instead. So if you do the same construction of the hybrid Wannier centers as a function of wave vector in a situation like this, uh, what you see is something like this. You basically have the, uh, the upgoing curves are the upspins with churn number plus one, and the downgoing curves are the uh, uh, quantum anomalous whole state with uh, downspin with churn number minus one, and then they, uh, then they intersect. If you, if you turn on the mixing, you do not open these degeneracies at uh, k equals zero and at k equals pi because those are protected by uh, Kramer's degeneracy. And so whether the system zigzags like this or not uh, de determines whether the to system is topologically uh, non-trivial or trivial. So uh, this we did for uh, the kane mali type binding model um, is a calculation of how these hybrid 1A8 centers behave as a function of kx in a part of the phase diagram, you just tweak the parameters to put the system in a topologically trivial phase or in the topological phase, and you see whether it zigzags or doesn't zigzag uh, is uh, whether the system is normal or topological. Now, how is this related to uh, topological obstruction? Well, if you try to construct 1A functions for a normal system, what will happen is 1A functions will come in pairs. There'll be a 1A function on this site and then a time reversal image of it with spin down, let's say it had spin up, the time reversal image of it will have spin down. If it had current going clockwise, it'll be, so you make the time reversal image of it, and those two 1A functions are orthogonal to each other, and then you can construct a whole set of 1A functions that uh, always come in Kramer's pairs. If you have uh, six bands, that is to say three pairs of bands, then there'll be three of these pairs of uh, 1A centers in your unit cell. Um, and in that case, you will always find that uh, you get this normal uh, dispersion of the hybrid 1A bands. Uh, if you have this kind of unnormal uh, dispersion of the hybrid 1A bands, uh, you cannot have uh, those Kramer's pair. So what happens in this case is that the statement about topological obstruction is a, a little bit more subtle. It is possible to make 1A functions for a two-dimensional quantum spin hole insulator, but you cannot do it in such a way that they come in Kramer's pairs. You can't do it in such a way that the gauge respects time reversal symmetry. You have to break time reversal symmetry in the gauge and then form maximally localized 1A functions uh, uh, in order to uh, make uh, uh, 1A functions. So it's kind of an odd uh, uh, situation. So for the quantum spin hole insulator, you cannot construct uh, ordinary 1A functions as you would in the way you expect where they come in Kramer's pairs. You can construct uh, 1A functions. We, we showed that explicitly. This was with Alexei Solyanov. Uh, you can explicitly do it if you're willing to uh, um, break the time reversal symmetry in the gauge. Okay. Um, the last part I want to talk about is what else we can do with uh, hybrid 1A functions. <clears throat> 
And um, uh, we did some work a few years ago about uh, how uh, these hybrid 1A functions, uh, here I'll be focusing mainly on the, just the hybrid 1A centers, are a useful tool for visualizing different kinds of uh, topology. So um, uh, here what we're doing is we're one uh We start in three-dimensional k-space, and we pick one direction, the z-direction, and we one erize in the z-direction. Uh, so there's another kind of hybrid, a double hybrid, right? You could go and, and, and one erize in two out of the three dimensions, but that's not what we're doing. So we one erize in the z-direction, we still have kx and ky in the horizontal directions. And so for each vertical string of points, we calculate the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, 1A centers uh, along that direction, and if you plot those 1A functions as a function of kx and ky, uh, you get pictures that would look something like this. This is the Brewan zone uh, uh, on the uh, x, y plane uh, on the bottom, and, and, and then, again, the vertical direction is real space, um, a z direction, and here are the, uh, the, these 1A sheets, and they have to be, of course, periodic in kx and ky, and this would be for a two-band model because there are two 1A functions per unit cell in the y direction. And this would be for an ordinary trivial, there's nothing special going on here. Uh, since these two sheets don't fall on top of each other, this, this would be for some magnetic system. If it were um, non-magnetic, then probably the sheets would be simpler. Uh, so uh, here's what happens if you have, uh, actually, here's what happens if you have time reversal symmetry. Uh, so this would be, um, a non-magnetic two-dimensional insulator, it turns out that uh, the 1A sheets are forced to um, touch at, uh, at four points, uh, which are known as the time reversal invariant momenta. So it's zero and pi in the kx direction and zero and pi in the ky direction. Uh, and that comes about from a kind of a Kramer's degeneracy uh, applied to the hybrid 1A sheets. And, um, uh, and so uh, what you can do is, if you uh, think about the, so what happens is that uh, in, in the time reversal invariant system, it's useful to focus on just one quarter of the Brewan zone instead of the full Brewan zone. So here's a picture of the full Brewan zone case space in all directions, but this is like one eighth. Uh, so you really focus on one quarter um, in the KX and Y. So now the horizontal axis only goes from zero to pi. The, KY only goes from zero to pi. This is the same picture as I had here, but I'm just showing one quarter of it because uh, by looking at just one quarter, I can see what's going on. So this is an ordinary uh, time reversal invariant system where um, uh, at an arbitrary K point in the two-dimensional Brewan zone, the wave functions at that K point don't have time reversal symmetry. They're related to some wave functions at minus K. Uh, and so these uh, two sheets uh, split from each other but they uh, meet at the corners. Now, what's a topological insulator? Here's an example of what's called a weak topological insulator, where uh, this would be for a, a system that has uh, two occupied bands. The Kramer's degeneracy requires that these bands touch at the four corners, but instead of touching in a way that does not involve any, um, uh, any zigzagging, here they zigzag in the y direction. If they zigzag in the y direction but not in the x direction or vice versa, that's called a weak topological insulator. Um, you can uh, look at, uh, you know, if you look at a given sheet and label whether the sheet touches from the top or from the bottom to the kind of a Dirac point in, in 1A band space, uh, then there are two tops and two bottoms in this case. And then a strong TI, what happens is you have uh, something like <clears throat> three, three tops and one bottom, or three bottoms and one top. Um, that turns out to characterize a strong topological insulator. So these hybrid 1EA sheets um, provide a way of thinking about uh, uh, topological systems. By the way, I, I, I didn't show this, but if there's a vial point, then these sheets sort of uh, spiral around the, the vial point um, in, in the sense of a Riemann, uh, Riemann sheets. Um, so this was work that was done mainly by my student um, at the time, Mariam Tahiri Nahad, and um, what she did, well, she did some tight binding models, but she also did calculations for uh, real materials. Um, uh, this antimony uh, selenide is a normal uh, uh, member of this class of materials that includes the well-known strong topological insulators, bismuth selenide and bismuth telluride, and she actually calculated these 1A bands, 
Uh, and you don't, when you do this for antimony selenide, you don't see much. You just see these basically are located, the 1A centers of p orbitals and so on. Uh, uh, this is a, a going around the four uh, sides of that one quarter B1 zone. And uh, here are the plots of, of what these 1A sheets look like. Not much going on. When you do this for bismuth selenide instead, look over here, you see that these, you get these zigzagging. So actually these 1A bands do zigzag in, 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 in one corner of the, of the B1 zone. If you look at the band structure, energy versus wave vector, you can't tell any difference by looking at the band structure of, between bismuth selenide and, and the antimony. Uh, but uh, when you look at the 1EA sheets, you find that they have these uh, touchings at the, at the B1 zone corner. Um, so, uh, and then there were some other examples that we did of other kinds of like mirror churn insulators and so on, where you can see something about the topology uh, by looking at the hybrid 1EA centers. Um, as a computational tool. So the last thing I'll do, there's just two slides and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not uh, go into, uh, into the mathematical detail, but I just wanna give you a feeling for this. So um, again with uh, Mariam and then uh, also with uh, Thomas Olson uh, and together with Evo, um, we had some papers where we looked at uh, what happens with these uh, hybrid 1A bands, that is the plots of uh, 1A centers uh, versus the two-dimensional Bruin zone. And um, so here, uh, what we've done is we've actually defined a Berry connection on the hybrid 1EA bands. So in other words, a Berry connection of the hybrid 1EA functions. So each hybrid 1EA function has a label L, which is the unit cell in the vertical direction, and N, which is which of the 1EA functions within the cell in the vertical direction. Uh, and then it, it, it actually has an argument, uh, uh, KX, KY, which is uh, uh, hidden. But of course, the Berry connection involves one derivative, and it's written this way, and the Berry curvature involves two, de two derivatives, and it can be written this way. And so each one of these 1EA sheets has a churn number that you can uh, define by integrating over the, over the Berry sheet. And so, for example, the total anomalous Hall conductivity can be written as a sum of these uh, hybrid 1EA churn numbers. And there's something that I uh, don't have time to explain, but if you uh, have run into it before, there's something called the Chern-Simons axion coupling that gives you a kind of a formal contribution to the isotropic magnetoelectric coupling. And we also found that it was possible to write the, uh, this uh, Chern-Simons uh, uh, axion coupling in a rather uh, pretty way in terms of the uh, 1EA sheets. Basically, you integrate over each 1EA sheet the Berry curvature times its Z coordinate position. Uh, and then there's another correction here which has to be included, but the topological piece is really this first piece. And so um, to do this, you need not just the hybrid 1A centers, but the actual uh, hybrid 1A functions and their Berry connections and Berry curvatures. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, another uh, project that uh, came out of this was looking at um, something called uh, surface polarization. So imagine that you have uh, an insulating uh, three-dimensional material uh, that has inversion symmetry in the bulk, uh, but the surface um, uh, has low enough symmetry so that the surface can have a non-zero polarization parallel to the surface. How do you calculate that uh, polarization parallel to the surface? And what we did in these papers was basically construct the hybrid 1EA sheets uh, in, a, in a slab calculation and calculate the um, electric polarization, which is the Berry connection, integrate the Berry connection in the, in the KX direction to get the polarization in the X direction. Calculate the contribution of each one of these 1A sheets to the polarization, and you find that there's some excess X polarization at the top surface, and maybe, depending upon the symmetry, maybe also at the bottom surface, or maybe the opposite sign at the bottom surface. Um, so, um, uh, so, uh, we have um, come across a couple of situations where these hybrid 1A functions are actually a useful tool for uh, deriving quantities that otherwise um, it would be hard to know uh, how to calculate. So uh, that takes me uh, to the end. I have time for, I guess, a few more questions. Um, the, the part about hybrid 1A functions, um, I use the hybrid 1A functions as a way of talking about topology and topological obstruction, but also as a way of visualizing topological systems and a little bit as a computational tool for uh, 
looking at, for example, uh, surface uh, topological properties. Okay, so I'll stop there and see if there are more questions. Thanks for the uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm very new to this field, so maybe this is uh, a nice question. But you were speaking that uh, for constructing this uh, hybrid banner function, you need a uh, localized, uh, like a uh, exponentially localized banner function. So for that, you need uh, a gauge field, uh, which uh, uh, like allows you to do that. And you also spoke about like you have to break time reversal to do this uh, in the case of set to invariant or whatever. But does this always happen? Like, can you always uh, define a smooth gauge for this, uh, like compiling with whatever, or will well, you need to break further, like symmetries or whatever? No. So the the thing is that uh, when you um, uh, in the hybrid one A construction, we're always doing the one dimensional uh, linearization, and so mathematically, it's the same as if you had a polymer. Uh, so a one-dimensional system with some periodic repeat, and you're constructing one-dimensional 1A functions. And um, <clears throat> so in this case, uh, if you remember, Nicola introduced the overlap matrix. So you take the, you take the cell-periodic block functions at this K and take the inner product with the set of them at the next K. So if you have, if you have let's say, four 1A functions per cell or four bands, then you're gonna have uh, a four by four matrix, and then another four by four matrix, and then another four by four matrix. And then there's just some four by four matrix algebra. What you do is you multiply all these matrices together, and then you do some singular value decomposition on the product, and you extract the eigenvalues, and, and there it is. So it, it's a completely straightforward operation in the one dimensional uh, case. Um, the problem uh, with um, maximal localization is because um, you have to try to maximally localize simultaneously in x and y directions or x, y, and z directions, and then you have some competition. Uh, if you, all you want to do is, is uh, maximally localize in the z direction, it's trivial. There's no competition. So it turns out that it's really very straightforward. You don't have to do any real tricks. So uh, when you say that uh, you need to break time reversal symmetry in order to get uh, exponentially localized linear functions, in, in, for example, in the example of the C2 odd, the Topeliakian insulator, what's the actual meaning of breaking time reversal symmetry on, on the basis? Because, I mean, the, the system still preserves time reversal symmetry. So when I say that the system has broken time reversal symmetry, I mean that it's a magnet. It's a ferromagnet or some... some in some cases, antiferromagnetic or ferry magnetic states will do it. So what I mean is that time reversal is spontaneously broken, right? In the same way that if you have a, a, a crystal that's a, a paraelectric and then it goes through a phase transition and becomes ferroelectric, well, this universe still has inversion symmetry, but the system has broken, spontaneously broken its, um, its uh, inversion symmetry. So I'm, I'm talking about magnetic systems in which time reversal symmetry has been spontaneously broken. So you can only have the quantum anomalous Hall state when you have broken time reversal symmetry, which you can see pretty easily because even for a metal, if you don't have time reversal symmetry, you can't have a transverse current because if you imagine reversing the, reversing, you know, playing the movie backwards in time, it wouldn't work. Um, and so, um, so, you have to discuss the case where the, the, where the material has time reversal symmetry and the case where the material doesn't have time reversal symmetry as two different situations and study the topology in, in, in those two situations uh, independently. In the case where time reversal symmetry is broken, you can have this uh, churn insulator uh, state. In the case where time reversal symmetry is present, you cannot but there's a new topological index, the Z2 index that you can define that is not defined in the magnetic case. So it's just two different cases that you have to consider uh, separately. Sorry, so I, probably I, I didn't explain myself well. So what I meant is that uh, in the C2 odd case, uh, 
Yes. When you try to construct the maximally localized one-year function. Ah, okay. Because you said that uh, you need to break time reversal symmetry on the gates transformation in order for the, the binary functions to be maximally localized. Yep. So what's the, the meaning of uh, breaking time reversal symmetry? Because, uh, I mean, the system still preserves it, right? So again, the way to think about it, I think, the uh, best way to think about it is in terms of those U matrices that um, Nicola was talking about. So uh, you can go, let's say, um, uh, from, 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 from one gauge to another gauge by introducing this, let's say I have four, four bands, so it's a four by four unitary matrix as a function of K. And if the matrix at K is the Hermitian conjugate of the one at minus K, and you enforce that everywhere in the B1 zone as you make your gauge change, that's a gauge change that preserves time reversal symmetry. So for example, if you uh, calculate all the states in the half B1 zone, and then in the other half of the B1 zone, you define them to be the states at k, the state at minus k is the one at k times the Hermitian, you know, conjugate. Um, that you start with a, a time universal preserving gauge, and then you apply U matrices that only have this property that the ones at k and minus k are Hermitian conjugates of each other, uh, uh, which for unitary is inversions of each other. Uh, then you then you preserve a uh, uh, then you preserve a, um, a time reversal invariant gauge. So that's, that's what I mean. And that, when you think about it, what that corresponds to is what I said, is that the 1A function come, come in Kramer's pairs. Uh, um, that, that's basically the meaning in real space of, of what I just said in K space. Um, there was a question on the chat. If 1A functions exist, the system has trivial topology. Is this statement only true for 2D systems or any dimensional system? Um, well, again, you have to talk about different symmetry classes uh, separately. But if we talk about the case of broken time reversal symmetry where you can have a churn number, in two dimensions you have a single churn number corresponding to the Berry curvature in the xy plane. In a three-dimensional insulator, in principle, you can have three different churn numbers corresponding to x, y, x, z, and y, z. If any one of those three churn numbers is non-zero, then you cannot construct uh, exponentially localized 1A functions uh, uh, for the uh, insulator. Uh, but then you can now go talk about the time reversal invariant case or other cases. Uh, let's maybe not go there. Um, are there, in general, problems to define 1A functions for other kinds of topological states? Yeah, so the basic paradigm goes through. Suppose you have a mirror churn number. A mirror churn number, I'm sorry, uh, 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 this is a kind of topological crystalline insulator where, uh, let's say, on a particular uh, kz equals zero plane, um, the states with odd mirror symmetry and e even mirror symmetry have equal and opposite churn numbers. That, that can happen, and that's called a mirror churn number. And then you can show that you cannot construct 1A functions that have mirror symmetry in the way that you would expect. So the general, general statement is that if there's some symmetry that protects the topology uh, and you're in a non-trivial state of that topology, then you cannot construct 1A functions that obey the symmetry in the way that you would naively expect. Once. Okay, yeah, we're getting a little over time. Um, so, you know, um, you can get, uh, for polarization, for example, you can have these Skarmion-like structures in certain systems, and that would have a, you know, non-zero topological charge. So do you think for those systems, you also have these problems of not being able to have the Vanier functions, you know, which I guess you could describe the local polarization from? I think that's uh, not a short answer. Um, but uh, so I think it's very, so what you're talking about is topology that happens in real space. And what I'm mostly talking about is topology that happens in k-space. And so you could talk about systems, let's say you put your skirmions on a skirmion lattice, and now you have topology that happens in both real space and in k-space, and how does that play out? Uh, good question. Uh, I don't have a short answer. <laughs>
I want to follow up about vial semi-metals. You said that the uh, this uh, vanier sheets start to curl and kind of uh, go along uh, the spiral. So does it mean that you also have problem with vanierization of something like thallium arsenate? Well, but gallium arsenide is not a vial. What did you say? Gallium arsenide? Uh, thallium. Oh, th oh. Th thallium arsenide, the, the vial semi-metal. Yeah, so, so again, if you have a vial semi-metal and you, you want to vanierize only the valence band states, by which you mean when you come to a vial point, only the ones below and not the ones from above, then you have a singularity in the description of the block functions at the vial point. And that singularity means that when you try to construct one a functions, they cannot be exponentially localized. They have power law tails. So you can't make one a functions for a for a vial uh, for a vial system. But if you include more states than than you could, or, or oh well, no? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can you can include some of the conduction bands, and then what you do is you one arise the larger space, and you use the one a functions as a basis for describing the the band structures, and then you'll see. So that's what 1A interpolation is about, which you'll hear about in the next talk. So that's a good segue, I guess, to e Evo. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Evo is going to use my laptop. So let me see if I can get this set up. So let's thank again, David.